Hello, I'm Scotty. And I'm Mikey. And we're some of the producers of this anime documentary, and we wanted to share with you a warning with this project. Yeah, over the years, this is the most recommended topic we've got. Everybody wants us to expose anime, so we started doing some digging, and man, this stuff is dark. So if you don't really have a problem or you've never been exposed to anime, this might be a project that you should prayerfully consider whether or not you should or should not watch it. But if you know somebody that's really into this topic, then please share our video with them as we feel like this is a very important topic to explore. Yes, so you have been warned. With that said, enjoy the show. Is that anime in the kids section? Yeah, isn't that crazy? There's a ton of it on Netflix now. I know, it's time to do a project on it. Mikey and I went to a local convention called Kanuga, and I was shocked at how many people are into it. Yeah, it's crazy just how many people have been asking us to cover it. I remember watching some as a kid, and now I realize how much of that stuff was going completely over my mind. There's so many reasons why I question it now. I didn't watch anime, but I read some of the manga comics. I know a few things about some of the mainstream ones. It's shocking how much spiritual imagery is used in these shows and movies. Anime has an undeniable influence over pop culture. Honestly, some of it is so strange. It's hard to even grasp how something like this can gain so much popularity. Do you know where it all started? In 1963, a little black and white cartoon called Astro Boy premiered in Japan. Within eight months, NBC began showing the English version in the US. The creator Tezuka was very influenced by Western culture and his father believed that Japan's future prosperity lay in partnership with the US and raised his son on American imagery. There's constantly Westerners appearing as peaceful scientist collaborators. Returns from the United States. The new minister will meet the press for the first time. That's the future he imagined. From the very beginning, he designed these cartoons to be exported, which is why we see so many Americans in the cartoon. Many other anime series were loved after that, such as Gigantor and Speed Racer, but in the 1990s, anime blew up in American pop culture. Speed Racer? Never heard that one. It's crazy how fast anime gained popularity in the US. In 2002, Boston was one of the first cities to hold a convention and they only expected 500 attendees, but 2,000 showed up. Today, Los Angeles hosts the annual Anime Expo with 100,000 plus attending. I remember in 2003, Disney Spirited Away won an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature. In the last two decades, imported anime series such as Pokemon, Sailor Moon, and Dragon Ball Z developed huge US audiences. Tons of movies have robbed their ideas from animes. Did you guys ever see The Matrix? Oh, yeah. Nope. Oh, yeah. What'd I miss? Well, you didn't miss much. It pretty much went downhill after the first one. Oh, wait, there's more than one? Uh, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it, but it drew heavily from the style of manga and even released its own animated series called The Animatrix. Everyone thought The Matrix was so original, but it pretty much was a direct ripoff of an anime called Ghost in the Shell. And Ghost in the Shell was made into a movie. Quentin Tarantino had an entire anime scene illustrating a character's backstory in the first Kill Bill movie. You guys ever watched The Lion King? 
Did you know that was also a direct ripoff of the Japanese animation titled Kimba the White Lion despite its claim of originality? <gasps> no! Tonight, we're proud to present the most successful film in the history of the Walt Disney Studios in its television network debut, The Lion King. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner, head of the Walt Disney Company. The Lion King is unique. Unlike our other Disney animated features, The Lion King is not based on any previously published fairy tale or literary work. Whoa, what? Michael Eisner is totally lying through his teeth. Wow, look at those characters are exactly the same. Yeah, even the scenery is strikingly similar. It's an original concept that was developed in the story department of Disney Animation. And like most Disney animated features, it took years to create and refine. Original? <laughs> More like originally it was ripped off of this Japanese animation. Disney should be ashamed of itself. They've made billions off this story. Billions with a B. Oh, and I bet they're not paying royalty checks for that one either. Even Warner Brothers did the same thing, stealing the original story from Tezuka with their release of Iron Giant in 1999, which was basically a reboot of the 1963 cartoon Gigantor. Originally, these animations appear to be pretty innocent cartoons. It's a misconception that animated productions are only made for kids, but that exists because aren't most animes marketed to young kids? Yeah, since they are all over Netflix and Cartoon Network, tons of kids are getting sucked in at an early age. When we went to Kanuga and interviewed fans about their favorite shows, this is what they said. I love anime! I love it. I mean, I can't watch enough of it. So describe <laughs> love like you watch it every week, every every year. Day. Oh, wow. Even more telling was the age that they were first introduced to it. So, like, what was your first anime you watched? Naruto. Yeah, let's Nana, hear from you. Wolf's Rain. Any watch <laughs> Every <laughs> single one out there. <laughs> so how old were you when you got into it? Oh, uh, very young. My, my father was really into um, Dragon Ball, and okay. he had, like, a bunch of um, VHS tapes, and I actually still have the whole Frieza saga on VHS. So how long have you been into it? About a year. Okay. Do, do you mind me asking you how old you are? Uh, 11. You're 11 years old. Okay. <laughs> how old? Of course, uh, probably like eight. Oh, eight. Wow. Yeah. Nice. It was on Adult Swim when I shouldn't have been up. <laughs> so and I watched it anyways. Would your parents have condoned? I mean, probably not, but here I am today. Yeah. <laughs> covered in blue paint. How long have you been into anime? And like, when did you first start getting into this? Oh, God. Um, my first anime was like in fifth grade. It was Attack on Titan, which was a mistake because I was a fifth grader and that, the mother getting the head torn off was a little much for me. At this age, think of the shock and horror that something like this would happen to your mother. My first anime was Attack on Titan. Uh, he's the reason that I started watching it. This guy, uh, he, uh, he was like, hey, you should totally watch this. It's on Netflix. I think you like it. Uh, and from there, I started watching like Death Note, a bunch of other stuff like that. Whoa, these guys are super young to be exposed to this kind of violence. So you're into anime. What was your first anime? My first anime was Heaven's Lost Property. Did he just say Heaven's Lost Property? And that just kickstarted that genre, and then I branched off. Like how old were you when you was? Oh, I don't know, like 10, 11. Seems, yeah, wow. I would even say that there's tons of animes that adults shouldn't watch either. These cyborg chicks like fall from heaven, and it's a harem anime. Yeah, and this one is super messed up. Not only is the anime extremely inappropriate with the images that are borderline pornographic, the story is also super blasphemous. So like, the protagonist has a bunch of cyborg chicks that can literally perform any task. Interesting. And he's into panties. I love panties with designs on them. Mm. I'm starting to get sick and tired of this foolishness. Sure, you got it. So they're like sex robots or something? <laughs> Yeah, but they're, they're programmed to do whatever their master wants them to do.
So what? Who's the master? I mean, what? Describe him. What is it? I don't know. He's like the tyrannical guy that lives upstairs. He's like the tyrannical guy that lives upstairs. Oh yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. You'll remain my toy for as long as you live. What's wrong, good for nothing? Have you forgotten what comes next? This is the part where you beg, Oh, please, Master, please don't scrap me. You have your orders, Delta. And so that got you into <laughs> Yeah, that, that shot me down that path, and then I branched off to different genres from there. Yeah, those kids were like 14. I know, right? It's so not okay or appropriate for such young kids to watch. And everybody we interviewed was super into anime. I mean, there wasn't even a single person who wasn't into it. And when asked about the appropriateness of the violence or sexual content, they all had this to say. But there's some anime like, um, I don't know, Kill La Kill and like Devil May Cry, like stuff like that. That it's not really meant for kids, but somehow kids are getting into it anyways. Is there any sort of like violent element to it? Some people violent. Wolf's Rain is extremely violent. It's very bloody, especially the end of it is very bloody. Yeah. Yeah, like it's got it a lot like, of fighting. It seems like a lot of the anime now is like pretty hardcore. Oh yes, a lot of old anime are as well, but it just, yeah. I think that uh, older anime were very targeted towards adults, and now they're trying to target more towards children too, so yeah. So how old were you when you saw the first anime? What was it? I was approximately eight years old when I watched, uh, when I watched Pokemon for the first time. And then I just gradually started with uh, Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, Codcaptor, Sakura, all those. It's wild that these kids get hooked because of Sailor Moon when it's full of extremely inappropriate and overly sexualized content. I'd say it's not suitable for any audience, let alone children. It may seem cute and colorful, but its main protagonists, which, by the way, are supposed to be 14-year-olds, are often in compromising scenes with extreme nudity. Here in the United States, pedophilia is a big no, and it's a super sensitive topic. That girl looks seven years old. Way too early to be worried about boys falling in love with them. Yeah, when the animes have like young kids in there, then you just automatically assume that it's for kids. But because it's an animation, the twisted storylines usually fly under the radar. But kids pick up on these themes subconsciously. And yet pedophilia can be found across anime, as well as themes of incest, homosexuality, lesbianism, and transsexualism. And it gets even more weird when original Japanese anime is changed for US viewers. In Sailor Moon, Haruka and Machiru are lesbian lovers, but in the American version, they made them cousins. He's exactly the type who's supposed to have a pure heart and powers. We should make sure we watch him closely then. Leave it to me, cuz. Mm-hmm. Okay. But someone clearly didn't think this through because they left the scenes the same, only changing dialogue, leaving the impression that they are some sort of twisted cousin lovers. Usagi, or better known as Sailor Moon, is a middle schooler who falls in love with a college student. There's even a scene of the characters engaging in sex. Okay, this certainly is not kids' material. Uh, maybe we should pause it. I'll get it! Hey, Fiesta Taco Delivery, well, there's a party in every bag. Uh, did anybody order tacos? Tacos? No, I didn't order it, but that should definitely be what we have for lunch. Man, it looks like you guys having a watch party. Um, uh, that's kind of weird. Uh, hey, this is not one of those weird fetish parties, is it? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. You see, we're, we're... Hey, look, I'm not judging. Just dropping off some food. This is not 66 Broad Street, is it? Uh, no, this is 144 Narrowway. But can we put in an order? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll be back later. Well, that was kind of awkward, but you know what's crazy? There are tons of reaction videos on YouTube where people don't find this scene disturbing. This isn't the only time that Usagi stayed overnight at her boyfriend's house. Uh, we should probably go wake Chibiusa. Let her sleep. Huh? Both of you can stay here tonight. 
This particular storyline is even carried over into later seasons of the show. There is even a scene where Usagi's love interest, Mamoru, accidentally kisses an extremely young five-year-old, Sailor Chibi, which, how do you accidentally kiss a five-year-old? Hey, what just happened here? <gasps> you there! What do you think you're doing? Why are you hugging my Momo? Momo? Hey! Back off! Get away from my man! Usagi becomes jealous when she thinks her boyfriend is falling in love with a grade school girl. It seems like the only thing you care about lately is Chibiusa. <sighs> Do you like her? Do you think she's that cute? What? That's ridiculous! She's still in elementary school. She's just a little kid. So what if she's little? That doesn't matter in love. Yeah, that's, that's disgusting. She's still another woman! <gasps> this twisted relationship is not the only young love to spring up. Naru, who is also aged 14, falls in love with Nafrite, who is 19. This is disturbing. You can clearly see that he towers over the little girl. Yikers, that's not something you want your kid exposed to. Oh, just wait, it gets worse. Even the villains in the series are gender-bending teenagers. The Sailor Starlights are three Sailor Senshi from another star system looking for their missing princess, which lands them on Earth to find her. In their civilian forms, they are biological men who created a boy band called Three Lights. So it's kind of like the Spice Girls meets NSYNC? Now that would be weird. They become female when they transform into their Sailor Senshi forms. Additionally, their leader is clearly in love with Sailor Moon, which is super confusing to the viewer because their genders constantly change. This sounds like something from 2020, but it came out nearly 30 years ago. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about sexual immorality. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5 says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. Amen. Great text, Keith. Along with all the adult-themed relationships, there are a ton of questionable messages and occult references that are very problematic for any Christian. I'm talking about magic, sorcery, spells, and reincarnation, and even underage drinking of alcohol. Thank you. It's very nice to make your acquaintance. That doesn't sound right. Glad to know you. <laughs> Look at them. They're not having any trouble. The book says in a situation like this, have something to drink. Here goes. You know, the Bible is very specific not to have anything to do with witchcraft. In Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, it states, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or useth divination, or an observer of times, or of an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord God doth drive them out from before thee. When the Bible uses the word abomination, it literally means that God hates those things and that he would excommunicate the people if they engaged in such activities. Do you guys notice the symbols on their forehead? Look like they are taken from astrology. Check this out. Wow, it reminds me of when the book of Revelation describes God's people having a seal on their foreheads and the wicked having a mark of the beast in their foreheads. Also like the opening of the third eye in Eastern and New Age religions, there is a ton of demonic possession in this show. At one point, Sailor Moon cries out to Saturn, which is completely pagan, and in some ancient writings is a reference to Satan. The city, she's restoring it. The character, Tuxedo Mask, blasphemously calls Sailor Moon the Messiah. The Messiah. Notice that there are five sailor girls, each named after different planets. The number five in the Wiccan religion represents the five points of the pentagram. Hey, speaking of Wicca, these magical girls are even called guardians. Uniting our hearts to fight as one is what makes us sailor guardians. Which is Wiccan lingo for the watchtowers that correspond to the four directions and the four elements. When the watchtowers are invoked, it symbolizes the connection to all things that exist, the fifth element being spirit. The series borrows concepts from the Bible, such as the Tree of Life, which is depicted in this show 
as a god-like being who was alone in the universe and then created humanoid people because it was lonely. The people eventually become evil and corrupt, resulting in the tree weakening and seeking help from Sailor Moon to regain power and be reborn. Man, how twisted is that? God created humans. John 1.3 says, All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. So if the tree created the humans, this is a blasphemous depiction of the true God, making it seem as he can be weakened by his own creation, and then he needs to seek help from the pagan witches in order to survive. You know, another anime that sugarcoats the occult is Dragon Ball Z. Have you ever seen this one? Oh yeah, I remember watching that as a kid. Yeah, a bunch of people we interviewed at the convention said they started watching anime because of that show. You know, this show's been around since the mid-90s, and there's a ton of episodes, somewhere in the range of like 600 plus in total. Wow, that is a serious investment of time if you watch all of those. You're not kidding. Right, and listen to what this particular fan who has hundreds of thousands of subs says about the show. Notice that these videos have millions of views. This just shows the impact this genre has on the public. Toonami was nothing less than a revolutionary siren call for a generation of young anime fans, replacing the older, more traditional Power Zone slot with a block filled nearly entirely with Eastern properties, such as Gundam Wing, Outlaw Star, and Sailor Moon. Up until now, the only real way to consume these shows was through trading VHS tapes or downloading low-quality fan subs online. But now, anime was being broadcast directly into our living rooms, and it was mind-blowing. And at the center of this movement and Toonami's most popular show was Dragon Ball Z. Keep in mind that this was late 90s American television where the most popular animated shows were family friendly titles like Doug and Rugrats. And by comparison, Dragon Ball Z was shocking. The show felt like a gateway into an entirely different world. A violent and even dark place, one of insanely powerful villains that committed genocide with barely a second thought, and horrific alternate futures, where our entire cast of heroes as well as the vast majority of the human race had been wiped out by malevolent psychopathic androids. It was a series where people could suffer grave bodily injury and heroes could die. It felt like a show you shouldn't be watching, one that couldn't possibly be airing on children's television, and yet it was. You see, like Sailor Moon, there's a ton of highly inappropriate sexual content and dirty innuendos. Some of the scenes are so disturbing that on this fact alone, it should detour pretty much anyone. Oh, okay, that's weird. There are so many of these extremely inappropriate scenes that it's crazy the American public doesn't ban it due to its promotion of pedophilia. When searching for the Dragon Balls, the young Goku is seen sneaking a peek at Bulma's underwear. Also really disturbing is this scene of Master Roshi asking to see under Bulma's dress. <laughs> a peek at your uh, underwear. Uh, dirty old man! an embarrassing object is what it takes to get my wish, then okay! <laughs> I've duped them into thinking this bothers me, and I get an easy Dragon Ball! Heck, underwear's not much different from a bathing suit! <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> oh, the shape! Oh, wow, when she lifted up her dress, she didn't even have underwear on, and this is rated Y7 for kids? Eesh. But even outside of those grotesque scenes, there is dark spiritual undertones that need to be exposed. Magic is a common tool used throughout the series, and witchcraft and spiritualism is looked upon favorably. The rivers, the trees, the wind, all the living things in nature, please offer me your energy. I ask of you, please! I almost have enough. The power is coming to me. 
I can feel all of it completely surrounding me. Just a little bit more. Here it comes. All right. I feel it getting closer now. There, it's done. If this won't stop him, then nothing will. The Bible strictly forbids any such practices. In Colossians 2.8 it says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For example, the witch character Baba is referred to as the fortune teller Baba. Baba is an insulting word in Japanese that means old hag or old witch. And Baba uses a crystal ball to see into the past present, and future, something the Bible condemns as an abomination to God. Like when King Saul summoned the late Samuel through a medium, in reality, he was speaking to a demon. Yeah, although I've seen a couple episodes, I still don't understand what this anime is really about. Hey guys, we hope that you're liking this documentary that we've made. Um, took us about a year to make it. Uh, there was a lot of effort that went into this, so I hope you're uh, definitely getting a blessing out of this. And we wanted to put this part up so that you guys would get a little taste of, of actually what the whole documentary is about. It's a four part series. Um, it's about three hours plus worth of material. And um, we've tried to put little parts and bits on, uh, on YouTube and it actually keeps getting taken down. That's right, we actually did a live about this because we wanted to show you guys what all was in this. And there was one clip, it was maybe about two minutes long from Full Metal Alchemist that we got from YouTube, but YouTube copyright struck it, took it down. Usually we can fight copyrights because of fair use. That fair use law is written so that we can comment and react and things like that, but nope, they won't even allow it up. So if you're out there and you're saying, why don't you just put it up on YouTube, they won't let us. So we are dependent on you guys we appreciate all your support that we've put a year's worth of work into this three hour documentary in four parts covers a lot of anime such as well we've got seven deadly sins we've got uh, death note we've got neon in genesis neon genesis inuyasha um Man, there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot of them. <laughs> we we basically that. wanted to pick the top ones that everybody was watching. And of course, there's tons more because as we've shown this to certain people, um, they've said, oh, well, what about this anime and this anime? So hopefully what you're getting out of this is the principle of the matter. You should be seeing a pattern. Yeah, if you see a pattern across the board of constantly attacking spiritual things, twisting biblical concepts, then there must be a reason why they're doing this. That's right, I just saw a comment today where somebody said, uh, I actually haven't watched anime in a long time and it's it's hard to find good anime and I was like, you know, that's a good principle. If you if it's hard to find good, best just to stay away from it altogether. So we hope you guys are enjoying this. There are links to the description if you want to buy this on DVD and put it on your bookshelf or if you want just the digital copy, we have both links. You can get digital download and the DVD and we love you and we thank you for all your support and we'll let you get back to the show. Let me see if I can explain. You see, the mission of the characters is to collect seven dragon balls that are hidden all over the earth in order to have two wishes granted by the dragon lord. The theme song repeatedly chants the phrase, dragon, dragon, The book of Revelation called Satan a dragon. So basically they are asking Satan to get them. The story centers around a young alien named Son Goku, who was sent down to earth as a baby. In the Dragon Ball anime, there are three supreme beings called the Super Saiyan Gods from Universe 7 that send the baby Goku down to Earth to destroy it. Isn't that kind of like the story of God sending Jesus down to Earth? Yeah, pretty similar, but the twist is instead of being sent to Earth to save it, he's sent to destroy it. We send adult fighters to planets with strong inhabitants, but to planets with weaklings like Earth. One of our babies is sufficient to carry out the order. Kakarot was sent to clean up this planet, but he obviously forgot his mission. Kakarot, what have you been doing here all these years? Your mission was to terminate all life on this planet. Why haven't you carried it out? Goku is an angry child who has an accident while growing up, causing him to change his motives from being the destroyer of Earth into the savior of Earth. There's an episode titled, The Father of Goku, and a prophecy was given to Goku's father, Bardock, that he will have a son and he will be a savior of the Earth. 
Take heart, Bardock. A savior has been born. One who has the power to save the innocent from people like Frieza. And you. <laughs> Mmm, someone else who wanted to become more powerful than three supreme beings. That sounds a bit like Satan. It says here on the DBZ or Dragon Ball Z wiki that Goku wants to become the most powerful Super Saiyan God, which can be obtained through a ritual involving six righteous Saiyans or special divine training. Five Saiyans with righteous hearts must join hands and instill their inner light into another. With this friend's energy flowing through him, this Saiyan shall then take the form of a Super Saiyan God. Focus on channeling your inner light into Dad. From your heart. That's right, Michelle. Now you're seeing who this really is. In the end, Goku takes the war back to heaven and destroys it. There's even a similar story of a tree in a garden, just like Sailor Moon, twisting the concept of the tree of life. It's called the Tree of Might, sometimes referred to as the Tree of Death. But once again, you can see the inversion of the truth. When one eats it, they gain more power. Only Kai, who are the kings of the universe, and eternal dragons are meant to eat the fruits. You mean I'm not allowed to eat any of that? You got that right, buddy. That tree there, it belongs to the great King Yama, and only he can eat the fruit. Ah, oh, come on, just one piece. In the Bible, we see an account of a serpent-like being promising ultimate power by eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, not the tree of life. It's interesting that they get their power from the dragon, who is called the eternal dragon god, or dragon lord. The owner of the tree is King Yemma. Here it says that Yemma's occupation is a judge. Dragon Ball Z has a lot of Gnostic imagery flipping the idea what's good and what's evil. Yama is actually a deity in the Buddhist faith known as the King of Hell. Yama is said to judge the dead and is the one who decides if the soul goes to heaven or hell. Seems pretty Gnostic if you ask me. It sure does. And so on the surface, Goku may seem like a Christ type, but when you really compare him with the Bible, he actually shares more characteristics with Lucifer. Goku is really a type of Satan which is made to appear like a savior of the people. Son Goku's character is based on the Chinese mythological character called the Monkey King, who in the myth gets invited to heaven and believes he will receive an honorable place as one of the gods, but is instead made the protector of the horses, essentially a stable boy, which is the lowest job in heaven. He rebels and proclaims himself the great sage or heaven's equal. Which so happens to be the similar story of Lucifer, who wanted to be honored as a god and eventually rebelled against heaven. He was cast down to earth, the lowest place in the universe. Yes, he sure was. And Goku's father-in-law is known as the Ox Satan. His alias is the King of Demons. In other words, his father-in-law is the ruler of demons. He lives on Fire Mountain, which is located in the Diablo Desert. That's interesting. Here also says Goku-san is married to the daughter of Mr. Satan. They had a baby who they named Pan. Of course they did. Allow me to introduce the greatest woman in the world, my wife Fidel. And this is her dad and infamous father-in-law, Mr. Satan. <laughs> <laughs> and this cutie patootie is our daughter. Say hi, Pan. <laughs> Pan is the Greek god who, where we get our modern depiction of what the devil supposedly looks like. You know, with horns and goat feet and he causes panic. They're not even hiding whose side Goku is on. Goku's team is called the Dragon Team. The character Mr. Satan, who is also part of the Dragon Team, is adored by all and sometimes referred to as the savior of Earth and the universe. Oh, he 
yelled at him. A pretty brazen move yelling at our planet's savior. This kind of reinforces the idea that Satan is the good guy and will be the savior of Earth. Wow, that's pretty blatant. And just so there's no mistaking exactly whose side this character truly represents, Mr. Satan's daughter, with one of Goku's sons, drives a car with Satan and 666 written on the side of it. What number did you just say? 666. After Goku dies and is resurrected, he stands before King Yema, who is the god that judges whether the soul goes to heaven or hell. Yeah, King Yema looks more like Satan than the god of heaven. Interesting, since it's the god of heaven who is the one that judges the soul whether it is fit for heaven or hell. All right, knock it off out there, you bodiless tramp. Single file, it's not too late to be sent down below, you know. Yeah, you can clearly see this flipped upside down world when Goku leaves Yemma and wants to travel to a particular part of heaven, he must travel on Snake Way to get there. Yeah, look at how the road is winding, where the Bible describes the path to heaven as the straight and narrow. In Matthew 7:14, it says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Wait, so do many of Dragon Ball's villains have common attributes of God? Actually, they do. For example, the villain King Cold has a title called the King of the Universe. Frieza, his son, is like the Prince of the Universe, much like Jesus is referred to as the Prince. King Cold has two sons, making his family somewhat of a kind of trinity. This is my son. I'm retiring effective immediately. From this moment on, Frieza will be your commander. In other words, the Cold Force has now become the Frieza Force. There's a prophecy that King Cold's son will die. Frieza dies multiple times, and each time, he's resurrected. Uh, welcome back, Lord Frieza. Don't dream of resurrecting again. That's kind of like the prophecy that was told to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, which talks about how Jesus will ultimately bruise and crush the head of Satan. In Genesis 3.15 it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And that prophecy was visualized in the fight where Frieza put his foot upon Goku's head, as well as his son's. Frieza has many forms throughout the series, but it is the same person. During the fight with Frieza, he asks Goku who he is, and he says he is the savior of the world. What? What are you? I am the hope of the universe. I am the answer to all living things that cry out for peace. I am protector of the innocent. I am the light in the darkness. I am truth. To good nightmare to you. Goku saying that he is the truth is like him saying he is like Jesus because John 14:6 says Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. Even saying that he is the answer to peace is a lie because he's born to fight, not bring peace. Exactly, Scotty. You see, Goku kills his innocent grandfather but feels no remorse. He says he will ask for forgiveness, but he never does. It is shown that King Cold is only bent on destruction. This leaves the viewer with a twisted understanding of God and makes him seem like an evil ruler. Even his appearance is with large horns on his head and a red cape. King Cold sits on his throne as he and his son approach Earth to destroy it. The imagery of the second coming is unmistakable. Yeah, the Bible does foretell of a time that God will destroy planet Earth, but it's only after he comes again and takes the righteous to heaven. We know only God has the ability to destroy the whole Earth. For example, the flood. Satan, even though he wishes he could, does not have this ability. It says in 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. God will cleanse the earth from wickedness and bring in an everlasting righteousness. According to ScreenRant.com, many fans cite the intended end of Dragon Ball as the conclusion to the Frieza saga. With Goku fulfilling the Super Saiyan prophecy and finally defeating the villain responsible for destroying his home planet. Of course, this moment ended up being the beginning of a whole new chapter for Dragon Ball rather than the ending. This gateway anime is full of satanic imagery. And what's with the sigil of Lucifer in Vegeta's forehead? Sigil of what? 
oh, this is like the sigil of Lucifer, so are you a satanist or anything contributing the satan pagan? Well, according to the website symboldictionary.com, the sigil of Lucifer means the seal of Satan. Used in conjunction with other symbols, its original purpose of the sigil was to aid in official invocation of the angel Lucifer. Demonic possession is prevalent throughout many of these episodes. I'm everywhere you are now. Inside you. You're where? You would probably call me a parasite, but it's far more complicated than that. You see, I also control you. You're my habit. You became a tougher without ever knowing a thing. You think you can control me, you disgusting little... Oh, I do control you. Go ahead, try to move your body. And whenever a character's possessed, we see that sigil in their forehead. You may have invaded my mind and my body, but there's one thing a Saiyan always keeps. His pride! Since when can the possessed say no to the possessor? <laughs> Just remember, his purpose is to steal energy from Majin Buu, so why not let him have his way for now? When Vegeta's fighting Goku, we see that Vegeta has the sigil. He refers to himself as the prodigal prince of bloodshed. Because I wanted him to reawaken the evil in my heart. I wanted him to return me to the way I was before! This is kind of imagery, like a reference to Jesus, who shed his blood for humanity. So it's kind of a twist that Vegeta ultimately wants to return to the way that he was before, a cold-blooded Saiyan. Yeah, so this leaves the viewer with the impression that the biblical Jesus is really evil. Vegeta even sacrifices himself. Trunks, Bulma, I do this for you, and yes, even for you, Kakarot. And so, one of the Earth's greatest warriors has vanished in a blinding flash of light, having made the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of his loved ones. His name was Vegeta, a proud Saiyan prince. But instead of going to heaven, he goes to hell, an inversion of Jesus. The character, Piccolo, says Vegeta is going to lay down his own life to save the people. So, in other words, do exactly what Jesus did. Right, Kendi. This kind of twists the truth about Jesus. You see that the Bible says that Jesus was never selfish. He was not prideful or he didn't have any evil character traits at all. And that's how he's described in 1 Peter 2.22. It says it like this, he committed no sin neither was deceit found in his mouth. So putting this seal on the villain's forehead makes this sealing appear to be evil. The Bible describes a seal that will be placed on the foreheads of God's true followers. Revelation 9.4 speaks about the sealing just before the end of the world. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Like the villains King Cold and Frieza, Vegeta is part of a trinity as well, the Saiyans. The father's name is King Vegeta, and his son's name is Prince Vegeta. The almighty Prince Vegeta! During one of the fights with Goku, we see one of the Saiyans creating life out of the dust of the ground. But as you can see, the life that springs forth is something evil, reinforcing the Gnostic view that God is evil. There's a lot of imagery of creation, such as when Vegeta creates the moon, a burst of light comes forth from it. When Krillin was about to kill Vegeta, Goku tells him in his mind, stop, we need to show mercy. He's, he's pure evil. No, listen, just let him go, Krillin. Show him what it means to be merciful. This makes you think that Goku is the merciful one and Vegeta is pure evil. There is yet another trinity in this saga, Bibbidi Bobbidi and Boo. Bibbidi Bobbidi and who? <laughs> <laughs> Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo. Well, Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo is a magic spell cast in Cinderella. Oh yeah, you're right. It does have something to do with magic and sorcery. There are many parallels with the Godhead in these three as well. 
As you can see, there's the sigil in their foreheads and on their clothing. And they are all from a planet called Planet Alpha, which is in Universe 7, and is shown to exist in the heavens. God calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. Wait, wait, wait. Isn't the number seven often a number associated with God? It sure is. And Bobbity, Bibbity's son, has an episode where he opens a so-called seal. He opens the seal and frees Boo in an attempt to destroy the people of Earth. In the Bible, Jesus is described in the book of Revelation as the only one worthy of opening the seals. Revelation 5.5 5 says, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. When these seals are opened, it will result in the deaths of the wicked. This happens just prior to Jesus' second coming. It's interesting that Bibbity, the father figure, is the one who created the seal, and his son Bobbity is the one who breaks the seal, much like God created the seal and Jesus the Lamb is the one who opens it. The biblical imagery is interwoven all throughout this series. When almost everyone in the earth dies, Vegeta ends up resurrecting everyone except the really evil people. I have two wishes I want to make. First, I want the planet Earth to be restored to its original state. And second, I want all of the people who were killed since the morning of the World Martial Arts Tournament to be brought back to life. Do you understand? Dende, I'm putting my faith in Vegeta's plan, and I'd like for you to do the same, okay? Of course, Goku. Arise, Paranga! <laughs> What is your next wish? Uh, please use your power to restore the lives of all those who died on Earth since the wizard Bobbity arrived there. Except for the most evil ones. Dende! Hurry it up! We haven't got all day, you know! Yeah, yeah, we hear you. Baranga's doing all the work. <gasps> your wish has been granted. The people of Earth have been restored to their home. <laughs> Vegeta, we did it! All the people are back! They're alive! <laughs> what the heck? I'm alive! I'll be darned! Yep, we're alive, all right. Look, same old traffic jam. We're alive! Woohoo! Hallelujah! All right, yeah! Yes, Mommy, we're saved! Once again, a parallel to Jesus' resurrecting the righteous at his second coming. He also wants the world to go back to the way it originally was. After Satan is destroyed, Jesus will create a new earth for us to live in. The Dragon Team characters thrive off of fighting. Even when presented with the idea that they could use the Dragon Balls to stop the apocalypse, Team Z outright refuses to stop fighting. They believe their whole existence is for the single purpose of fighting. This is a Luciferian mindset. When Lucifer, or better known as Satan, was cast out of heaven, he raged a ceaseless war in which the whole world has been engaged in ever since. Now that's a great comparison, Mikey, because the Bible says in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, it says, Now war arose in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, and the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him, just like Goku was cast down to earth. Even when the prophecies in the Bible foretell the ending of this conflict, Satan and his angels refuse to stop fighting. That's why, in the end of the story, Goku brings the war to heaven. Goku is a representation of Satan, that ancient serpent, the great dragon. Oh wow, the DBC fandom even says that Goku's son lives in Satan City. Satan City? Wow. Dragon Ball Z teaches an inverted gospel which makes Satan the hero while demonizing the Trinity. Hey, that was Mr. Satan. Huh? Mom, it's Mr. Satan. I'd recognize that voice anywhere. Hey, you're right, wow. 
Everyone! It's him! Mr. Huh? Satan! Yes, oh. Raise your hands! Oh, it's him! The Special powers, the world champion is speaking to the entire planet from a battle that we can't even see. This is fantastic! Satan! 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 Thanks to Mr. Satan, the long-awaited energy has finally arrived from Earth. Would you really expect anything else from the Dragon Team? Speaking of inverted gospel, you guys ever heard about the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion? Hey, isn't Neon Genesis Greek for, is it New Beginning? And Evangelion means gospel. Right, it's about a new beginning of the gospel. Yeah, I bet I can guess what kind of twisted message they're going to interweave into this story. This sounds super intriguing. I'd love to hear what you have on that. This one's pretty messed up, but I can't get into it right now. I've got a podcast I'm doing tonight with a ministry called School for Prophets, and I can't be late. Oh man, you can't leave us like that. Give us a little sneak peek. All right, but just two minutes, then I gotta head. That'll give your kids some nightmares. Same time tomorrow. See ya. Bye. Bye. Wow, this show is truly messed up. Just gonna say, there's a party in every bag. You're the delivery guy, you're bringing tacos. There's a party in every bag. All right. There's a party in every bag. Yeah, a little more excitement, though. And, and thicken your accent. There's a party in every bag, you know? There is a party in every bag. Oh, you just, a little more excitement. Here, try, try the hat. Hat? No, I'm not Come on, just put that. It'll, it'll oh, help no, you, no, it'll no, help no, you no. get in character. Oh, come on. It'll help you get in character. Okay, okay now. And it's a party in every bag. Perfect! That's it, that's it, bro. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah.